Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that, unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right. Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Right. I'm Egberto Willis, your host. Thank you so kind for being a part of the show. We're going to have a great show for you today. We're trying to start early because we got a 55-minute interview that I did on on my book and and several progressive things uh, with uh, the Texas Grassroots Alliance that I that I think is of interest. Not only to speak about being a very long weekend and tired, but you know what? We're going to have a great show to show you with this. I I'm going to get started in a minute. Yes, I understand about the drones. Let me tell you, Iran did not want to cause any damage in Israel. They wanted to make a point to let Israel know I can get there. If Iran wanted to cause some damage, all they had to do, if it, instead of releasing two or 300 or so drones, they could have released about 500 and so on. They would have overwhelmed the Patriot system, the Iron Dome and all these others. And enough of it would have gone through to make a difference. They just wanted to show that, remember, we can get to you. And just like the United States can get to you from in South Carolina, they can still get to you over there. We can get to you, Israel. So you may come with your bombs. You may take out some of our assets, but we can get to you. Is that what you really want? Do you really want to escalate? Because again, it's not about who has the baddest power. It's about who has the ability around the world to use it. Uh, when Israel invaded Syria, uh, the, the embassy in Syria, they invaded Iranian soil. That is just like somebody going into the embassy in Israel and attacking us or going in into the embassy elsewhere. But I spoke about that on KPFT this morning. I'll try to process that video and put it out uh, subsequently. But for now, ready for another FU week. No, 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 no. It's ready for us to move forward. I am positive of what's going to be occurring in November. We are going to make a difference. But anyway, folks, let me go ahead and get that video started because it's uh, it's going to take up most of the time. So let's get busy. Welcome, Bruce, Lee Grant, Yvette avery Herod, Dave Denny, Michael Rudnan, who's feeling sick and tired. Come on, Michael, we're going to have to fix you up, brother. But we're going to be fine. Here we go. This is Texas Grassroots Alliance live stream, and I'm uh, Neil Aquino with the Houston Democracy Project, Alexander Montavo with the Texas Grassroots Alliance, Tarrant for Change, our guest, Egberto Willie of the Politics Done Right broadcast in Houston, KPFT. But we're discussing today his book, Tribulations of an Afro-Latino Caribbean Man. Hello, Egberto. Thank you for having me, Neil, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to discuss my new book. You're always providing opportunity. Your show is, is extremely open, and your two shows always provide op opportunity for activists, for grassroots folks, for rank-and-file folks. You even occasionally have an, an elected official on. We, we haven't stooped so low here at the Texas Grassroots Alliance live stream, but maybe someday we'll take the plunge. Uh, Egberto, tell us who you are. Well, I'm Egberto Willis. I'm uh, originally originally from Central America and uh, Panama specifically. I came to the United States in the uh, early 80s, late 70s uh, to go to college. I, I did my stint out here as usual. Uh, you know, I did all the things that I needed to do to get my degree. And what I did with that, you know, people people always see me with this smile and I'm always positive with everybody, etc. And mm -hmm. some have the tendency to believe that what that means is that, well, uh, I'm that special kind of black guy that doesn't have any issues. Sure. Well, I always tell people that, no, 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 no. Disposition have little to do with the tribulation one has to go through based on who they are. And I use the book as an opportunity to point that out uh, for both, for all sides, not just uh, white folks or black folks or everybody in between, but to let folks know there are tribulations that we all go through, and the book is really meant for 
every single person to see what an individual can go through and how one can supersede that. And so, um, and you're juggling so that the title, Tribulations of an Afro-Latino Caribbean Man. There's about three identities in that, right? There's right. Three, and you're an American citizen, so there's an another American identity. Citizen. Yeah, you see, I walk out of a car. I'm a black man. That's all anybody sees. If, if a cop stops me, I'm a black man, you know? Right. So I suffer whatever grievances that pigmentation gives me. But then there are some issues also where I am a Latino. I'm from a, I'm a, I'm a Spanish speaking country mm -hmm. with Spanish culture, etc. You know, I don't share all the same cultures of my black brothers and sisters in America. And I'm also Caribbean, mm -hmm. which, which also has its own flavor of, uh, of identity. So I support them all. And then lastly, I'm an American and right. I, I, I I believe in the country and I want to do for the country just like any American wants to do. Right. So uh, you grew up in in the canal zone, proximate to the Panama Canal Zone, correct? In it? It's amazing because, I mean, people always, people are in, just love to hear, wow, the canal is this great operation, right? Uh, when I was five years old, I could walk up a hill and look down and watch the ships go through something called the Culebra Cut, which is the, the biggest cut between mountains that was done for the Panama Canal and watch the ships go through. Okay. What tourists do there, I did whenever I just wanted to go up a hill and take a look. So were you, so, okay. So John McCain, for example, was born in the Panama Canal zone. Yes. And as much as John McCain was born in the same exact hospital that I was born in, right. Poco Solo, guess what? He had an American passport. I have a Panamanian passport. So did the law, why? why? If he was if he was born on American soil and you were too, what, what was the law? What, what, what was the dis difference? The canal zone is actually, wasn't American territory. It was leased to the Americans, just like they lease bases in, in J Japan or lease, yeah. lease land in, in France and all these other places where we have bases. Uh, that's all it is. So, so notice that uh, whenever you were born in, in uh, France or if you're born in Germany or whatever, you go to the consulate to say, you were born of American parents, so you want to ensure that your kids are native-born mm -hmm. citizens of America, even as they were born in foreign in, in a foreign country. And that's what gave McCain his U.S. citizenship and not Panamanian citizenship, because in reality, he's a Panamanian. If you're old enough, you remember the fuss over the Panama Canal Treaty, right? It was it was uh, yeah. Jimmy Carter took a lot of political heat. And Ronald Reagan, he wanted to give it back. And, and Ronald Reagan said, we paid for that canal, right? It was a, it was a jingoistic, nationalistic issue. It, it is amazing because the reality about the canal is, is stark. Is stark. I mean, Panama wasn't a country in 1903. Uh, it was actually a province of Colombia. Mm -hmm. United States asked Colombia to build the canal. Colombia said, hell no. The Lesseps and the, the France and France was already attempting to build a sea level canal then, but then uh, you know the United States remember uh, speak softly and carry a big stick. Right. The United States uh, no, uh, got some rebels in Panama to create uh, a revolution and to stop Colombia from enforcing their territory. They parked a, a battleship outside in Colón, the city that I'm from, right. to let Colombia know with no uncertain terms, Panama is a new country. United States recognized them immediately in 1903 and signed the treaty, the Panama Canal Treaty in 1903 with people that weren't actually Panamanian. Did you interact with Americans? Was there a... Yes. I was born on a canal, so my parents lived in originally in Cologne. And then uh, when my father got a, a bigger job, he then moved into the canal zone. And uh, so while in the canal zone, Panamanians lived together, there was segregation. Panamanians lived together in communities that were actually substandard now that we know it. Right. But and Americans live in other sections like Margarita, Gatun, those places were for Americans. Arco Iris, Rainbow City, Co Corner were for Panamanians. Now, they also had two different school systems. Our systems were called the Latin American school systems, 
the system for the Americans were, were the standard American system. They made sure that the Panamanian kids and the Panamanian folks didn't really interact. So you came to America. Why did you come to America? Because America really has some of the best universities on the planet. And, uh, you know, the, the, the selling point of America is actually great. And uh, again, the universities are great. And what most Panamanians are uh, that went to the canal zone, this, the, the next place that they usually come to is United States for an education. If they don't go to the Panamanian uh, universities and decided they want to sort of expand their horizons, a few would also go to Brazil or Spain, but uh, most actually came and went to the United States because again, the United States has a great college education system that has always been very well funded. Not so much as now, but has always been very well funded. So you went to UT, you went to University of Texas, Austin. Yes, interestingly, I came here on a music scholarship to be an engineer. Okay. <laughs> so uh, my, my professor on the Canal Zone had a good friend who ran the band at Blinn College. So that director gave me a scholarship to play the tuba and the bass guitar in Blinn, but I couldn't take, you know, I always knew my horizons were, I wanted to go somewhere else. So after being one year at Blinn, I applied to A&M, UT, got into both and decided to go to UT. How do you get started with the tuba? What, what, why'd you play the tuba? Back in high school, I was, uh, the, the, you know, our band had one tuba player and I was a big guy and I played the tuba and we marched with the tuba, we did everything. So I started out playing that in uh, high school. As a lover of the band program and being a, a former band student, um, there's there's a, a, a known knowledge that you always respect the tuba players. There's something yes. about tuba players that are the coolest. They carry <laughs> the heaviest instrument. Yes. And so uh, it tells you a lot about a tuba player because they are high quality folks. I love I love Alex, man. You, you the tubas, that's right. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, um is there a tuba so are there tuba sol tuba solos? Is there music specifically written for tubas? Yeah. And, and in fact, if you listen to a whole lot of Mexican music, there you have the Mexican music that usually has a good star in tuba line, you know, and uh, you, you know, doom, doom, do, 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 do. Yeah. Oh, I mean, oh, yeah, definitely. definitely. I wish you remember the name. There's a New Orleans based brass band that plays a lot of tubas and they do a, yes. a hell of a cover of, of Joy Division's Love Will Tear Us Apart with, with, with tuba. It's just, it's just great. I got a quick question, Alberto. Neil, I, I wanted to ask Alberto something you, you know, there's this musical connection, right, with the Latino uh, culture. Um, your book is about, you know, you being a Caribbean Afro-Latino man. Um, and you talked about how there's, you know, definitely a, a distinction between you and other Black community members who are born in the, in the mainland of America um, and not a part of the Latino community. I would love to, to get uh, your perspective just uh, because of this history, because of, of the experiences you have, how has that been navigating the Latino community and the Black community? What are some of the things that you feel are crucial for folks to understand uh, what it truly means to be Afro-Latino? Let, let, let me add to that. You, you wrote of an Afro-Caribbean Latino solidarity. Yes. In your book, right? So just let me just add a dimension to, to, to that identity question that Alex. I, I think that's great and that's an important one. I told two stories, one being at Blinn and one being at UTA. So I'm gonna to try to combine those two stories. When I came to the United States and I went to Blinn College, I'm a young 18 year old kid. And you know what young 18 year old kids look? They're looking, oh, I see a whole bunch of girls standing up here. And these were a whole bunch of, uh, you know, black girls that were in the, um, it, they were cheer, I think cheerleading or something like that at Blinn. So I walked up and I started to talk and in Pat and Mama, we call it estoy dando mi piropo. You know, I'm giving my little thing to try to get a lady. And they laughed at me, right? Because it was sort of a, this guy sounds funny and his approach is different and all of that. But interestingly, the white girls, they were like kind of intrigued and they, they really wanted to talk to me and were like very accepting. 
And of course, the Latinos just slapped me around, you know, we'd go because we all parted together, etc. So it was an interesting dynamic that at Blinn, the, the women that gave me the most play then were white women. When I came to the University of Texas, the first place I went to was an institution, meaning the group that I was going to be a part of was the um, Afro-American Culture Committee. I said, okay, I'm going to go to UT. I'm going to become a member of this committee. And one of the things that happened then was it was during the Martin Luther King times. And I, after we all started talking, I said, hey, but I'm kind of a Malcolm X guy. Uh, you know, I believe in not asking for your liberty, but taking your liberty, right? Taking your freedom. It didn't go over too well in that room that I said something that they took as a slight on Martin Luther King, which it wasn't. It was just saying a different tactics. And they really got into me and they were like, you ain't one of us anyway. You're a damn import. That, I, that stuck to me like, you know what? You're an import and you are not from here and you don't get it. That was the first time I got a chance to interact with my black brethren in America and as a black Latino to come out and then say, let me remind everybody that when the ship came from Africa on that slave trade, it stopped in Brazil, which had a whole lot of black folks speaking Portuguese then. It stopped in Panama and Costa Rica and all these other places where you had brothers speaking Spanish and it stopped in the Caribbean with the British where we spoke English and it then came to the United States. Remember, they all picked us up from the same place. So while we speak a different language, we all share the same history of colonialism, of slavery, of being abused, no matter what part of the world we're from. That sort of brought me into the into the black fold. I mean, I, 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 but it also there were there were also issues then with American Latinos because again, American Latinos didn't quite have that history. They th they, they they they're just now really learning about. Well, I'm talking about in Texas now, about the Dominicanos and the Cubans and, and all that stuff. So the dynamic that one has to travel living in these not only pigmentation cases. I, I don't like the word race because race is a stupid thing, but whatever. When you're living in this space, there is race that I don't like, but there's also ethnicity and culture. And they're by no means the same thing. And uh, these are things that one has to navigate. And I've given the story about a Panamanian that I grew up with, not ever thinking that this guy had white skin. He came here and I was the only person he knows. And we were kin folks because we are both Panamanian. And then he discovered his whiteness when a fraternity invited him in. And the fear that he looked at, that he took when he saw me coming and the phone calls that no longer occurred and all of that sort of stuff. So it's amazing the dynamics that happen. And when I talk about tribulations of what somebody with this ethnicity, this, this pigmentation and all of that goes through, it doesn't only cover blackness, it covers whiteness and it covers what one known as Latinidad, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the Latin issues that are also there because they stuff Latinos in one box as if, okay, this is how Latinos behave. A Mexican Latino ain't a Cuban Latino, ain't a Dominican Latino, ain't a Puerto Rican Latino, ain't a Panamanian Latino. Right. And I think that's huge in terms of just the importance of this book that you wrote that up front and center is talking about identity and talking about, you know, the impact of what identity can do in terms of the experiences you have in life. And I think for a lot of diverse communities, uh, because of colonialism, because of the structures that we navigate through, um, identity is something that folks are wrestling with all the time in diverse communities in America uh, and, and in other parts of the world, right, where, where colonialism has, has been so impactful um, and detrimental. So I, I think it's so important, this topic that you are bringing up front and center, that we really need to normalize more and more the discovery and also just the conversation around identity because there are so many unique attributes to what makes each of us who we are and we're constantly trying to fight um you know 
this desire for an acceptance, right? I mean, I mean, we want to be accepted, but we also want to be able to understand who we uniquely are um, and how our history and our paths have crossed. So, so thanks so much for sharing those stories, Egberto, and just for this book in general, because um, a lot of times we hide from identity or we feel shame in our identity or we we feel like we need to model certain things we see in order to validate our identity. And, and it's really important that we just continue to have a space for each other where we can have these conversations. And with grassroots organizers, you know, we see this on the front lines all the time, talking in different communities. There's some assumptions you can make being on one part of town or another part of town or being with one com community culture or another. But really, when you get to know people, when you get to work with people, it really is about understanding the unique identity that we carry with ourselves and how we can help uplift each other in this work. So uh, just so just appreciate that. Uh, Neil, I'm going to hand that, that off to you because uh, I know you got some great uh, additional questions, but uh, thanks for thanks for that uh, that that story and just for this work as a whole, Alberto. So you tell a story. Uh, you're walking down, and some guys in a pickup call you the N word, and um, but you didn't. You felt you were certain it was directed at you, and you were with some other Latino folks, right? But yeah. it was they were different pigment, right? Um, so what'd you what'd you did, what'd you think though? Did you had you been had you been called that word in Panama? Would you would would that happen? You know, interestingly, in Panama, one, I never was, that word was never used on me in Panama ever. But I tell you, in, in Latin culture, uh, using the, the racial terms, I don't want to say come with a bit of endearment, but it, it has a different right. flavor. It's not mean like it is over here. Like we always talk about mi negra or mi negro or, 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 or yo soy mi moreno or something like that we, when we're talking about each other. Like, the, you know, we, we, we kind of gradate, uh, uh, give different gradations to complexion, right? But really not in a very evil way. I'm not saying racism isn't there, but it has a different connotation when it comes in the Latin culture. But there it was shocking when the guys uh, shouted it out from the pickup truck. And I am sure because these were mostly... Uh, very light skinned or white Latinos that I was with, they hadn't a clue of what was actually going on. I think two of them, if I remember, they were from Argentina, Ecuador, and uh, Guatemala. Those were the three countries of most of the people that I hung with at Blinn. And uh, so that's where it came, you know, that's that's when it did, did happen. And, you know, they didn't have a clue, but I knew exactly what was going on, right? Uh, you know, I, I, while I wasn't called that in Panama, I, I saw Shaft, you know, right. in Panama. What are, what are some ways that you can buy the book? One, one link, politicsandright.com slash books. Not only gives you this particular new book that I have, but the other books that I've written. So it's a good place to, uh, to, to, to pick up on, on getting the book. Um, of course, you also get to the site where we do our radio show, which, of course, you have been a mainstay on. Neil Aquino, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a beloved member of the Politics Done Right family on KPFT every single Thursday, which well, we enjoy. I think he has his posse over there now. I, I, I appreciate the hospitality of you and, and, and the studio crew and, 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 and the callers over there. You're done with college, what's next? Well, that is, and, and you know, a, a, lot of, a, a lot of what I put in the book is, okay, after college is when real life begins, right? That's when you decide the employment that you're going to have. That's when you decide if you're going to be in business for yourself. That's what determines a whole lot of your life. And so a lot of the stories that I tell in the book are all the different things that occur after college. Yes, I had my tribulations in college. Yes, in college, teachers took you for granted. Yes, I stood up to teachers, etc. All of that happened. But the real life begins after college. And from the beginning, when I got into uh, in, into the workforce, it was all there to see. Most most people, when they get into the, the workforce, we just accept things. We accept things for how they are. You know, the only things I accept for how they are is when I'm around the cop. And that is because, well, we all know, you, you know, cops are always right. Right. And in our society, it seems like cops are always right. So we give them the benefit of the doubt till we get them in court and we hope we can get dispensing then. But when it came to employment, 
I was never I, I was never a pushover. And what I do in the book is I try to show some of the stories that happens to people uh, for 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 the people of color who read those stories. They're going to understand it immediately for my white brothers and sisters who read the story. There are some of that stories they're going to say, God, I saw that, but it didn't even ring a bell. And I think that's in your last chapter. You reference you wrote this book for two separate audiences, right? You just yes. you just delineated that, uh, yes. right? So what are you dig, dig a little deeper to that? What are you What are you hoping that the disparate audiences will get? And then are there things in the book that you hope both audiences will equally conceive? Yeah, well, you notice I said two audiences really: a people of color audience and a white people audience. And and let me tackle the people of color. Like I said, they're going to read the book. And for the ones that are not, uh, that are that haven't bought into the fallacies of a of America that's a great melting pot already, they'll get it. Now, for my white brothers and sisters, this is the kind of stuff that that I that I, I want to reach at. Right now, there's an anti DEI movement, as if you, we don't need that. It's reverse racism, etc. Because many really don't see that racism and and prejudice and lack of opportunity has taken a different form mm -hmm. and what i've shown i think in in the book with all the things that have happened with me uh in in business employment and just existence they a lot of things that people won't see on the outside they'll see oh i can see why that is needed let me give a perfect example when I am not going to give the NASA example right away, but let's just talk about me being in business. Uh, when I when I decided to go in business, I had a successful business. I just didn't have cash or capital. I went to the bank with a a friend of mine. Both of us were going to apply for a small business loan. Uh -huh. uh, he got into the bank. He and by the way, he's a good friend, but he was a coke addict. Okay, uh -huh. uh, this white guy. And he went into the bank and they made him fill out paperwork, et cetera. It was easy for him to get the small business loan. I went into the bank. The guy said, you had any collateral? No. He said, don't even bother filling out the application. So right then and there, I formed my company on credit card debt, 18, 20, 25% interest yeah. rate. He formed his company on 6% interest rate. Somebody can say, well, you know, you got the loan. He didn't. No big deal. But he got a, he got a privilege that I didn't. He could sure. build his business on 6%. I built mine on 18 to 25% credit card debt, right? Mm -hmm. So what I try to explain in the book is that ha that kind of stuff is happens. And when we talk about DEI and the reason we have to have some sort of equity is when you think, see things like that happen, it actually affects your ultimate success or your success is degraded, not based on your abilities, but your success is degraded based on your ethnicity, your complexion, who you are. At NASA, this one, another quick example. At NASA, you worked I, at NASA. Yes, I did. What was what was your what were you doing? I was a senior programmer analyst and a senior research engineer. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, uh, I, I told several of the stories in there re relative to NASA, but the one that always got to me, and this one is sort of people would think it's simple, but it is inherent to how people are treated, right? I am, I am at the, I am at the the place, and I, I have my cubicle. John D has a, her cubicle at the window, and I never thought anything of it. But when she quit, I go into my boss's office and I said, "Hey, anybody made had dibs on her office yet?" Which was at the window, and he said, "And this was in Clear Lake, no." So I said, "Okay, I am making the first dibs for that office. I want to move my office to her." office now that she's gone he turns around and he looks straight at me and he said oh i'm sorry egberto that that the, the window offices are relegated to seniors but guess what senior staffers yes yeah. i was a senior not knowing that i had the worst cubicle even as a senior and the seniors there that were white had window seats and cubicles mm -hmm. and i didn't i didn't have a clue so he just came out and blurted that out and I smiled and sure. I said, oh, I'm a senior. And he got red face and he stopped it. Oh, I, but, but, but uh, uh, well, uh, I don't. And I, and I stopped him and I said, I don't know what you're going to do. And I, 
And I walked out of his office. I went to my briefcase, picked it up, walked out of the building in Clear Lake, jumped in my car and started off. I lived in I lived in Houston. I worked in Clear Lake, drove home. By the time I got home, a call came in to let my wife know. And, and she he wanted my wife thought something was hell of a wrong sure. to let me know that, oh, by the way, it's yours. But the issue is, why do I have to go through things like this? Right. So, uh, so th those types of uh, those types of things are a constancy, but it's a constancy in the light lives of POCs right now. And even look, there are good people out there that do the right thing, but too many of us are faced with the right thing not being done. And in that process, most people just acquiesce to it. They're quiet about it. It's something that I was never quiet about. I would do things at the risk of losing my job, including a time when there was a time when all the, the black and Latino folks would meet up at my cubicle and we'll be shooting the bull and all that kind of stuff. We had Africans, we had Latinos from just about every country. We'll just talk and we'll we'll have these types of conversations, you know? And I remember my boss uh, coming down to the aisle and he had his cigar. What the hell are you running here, Rickberto? The damn NAACP? You know, it, 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 it is the things that you have to go through in these systems. And nobody talks about it because, well, you talk about it, you know, what's going to happen? I was one of those crazies that I think, in fact, I think I was too crazy for the five years I worked in corporate America. I think I was a bit too crazy to get fired because they didn't know what, what it meant. You know, uh, if some, you know, they really didn't know what it meant. Yeah. And I, I think it's important for folks to um, not only hear that kind of experience, like Berto, that, that this is a reality for so many people of color, um, but that uh, white supremacy exists everywhere that we go. This myth, the destructive myth of white supremacy uh, exists. And you're in a place, you know, that's NASA, right? That people mm -hmm. would think. They're here to do the greatest things together. You know, the best minds, the best ideas are going to win here. Uh, and yet we see the destructive myth of, of white supremacy. And I, and I think it's important for folks to know for grassroots organizers, this destructive myth also exists. And so when people are grass, doing grassroots organizing, especially within a progressive, um, you know, with a progressive perspective or the progressive outcome that's being desired, which... Um, you know, the best way to I think for myself, this is the way I define progressive is we want systemic change. There is systemic change that's needed um, in order for us to to have the um, the changes for community members, you know, that can be over a spectrum of issues. But that when we're fighting for these things and when we're organizing for things, that destructive myth of white supremacy even exists there. It even exists in progressive spaces. So that just like the workers of NASA, who are people of color, who, you know, you saw will just kind of, you know, stay silent about it, you know, modify their behavior or, or make some adjustments. We see that happening in grassroots organizing as well. And it's extremely harmful because we're here in a space fighting for the social justice <laughs> that we're trying to achieve, right? So when grassroots organizers um, are, are people of color and they're pursuing funding, uh, we'll, we'll see certain aspects and certain mentalities like, no, 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 I actually don't want to receive money because I don't want it to be seen that I'm doing this for the money. And if you're in grassroots organizing, you know there is not the money <laughs> we are doing this for we, we are doing this for the betterment of our communities but that we should feel comfortable getting compensated for labor uh, we should be co comfortable challenging the status quo and and we see that destructive myth of white supremacy existing within this important work that we're doing as you saw in your workplace as i've seen in my previous workplaces and it's so important for people to understand um, that I think when it comes to even like the political party space, why so many folks struggle to stay in that space or navigate it is because they are sidelining diverse voices. 
uh, in a number of ways that continues to have them put it in a place where they're not getting the results that they want. They're not getting outcomes that they want, but it really, in order to get those outcomes, it's got to start with the organizing, the trust, the relationships, the community that's going to get us to a better future. And so I think that example for me is, 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 is like touches right on a nerve of what we see day in and day out. And I'm curious to kind of, uh, as you, as you reflect on that experience in the book and reflect on this experience, you know, um, here on the live stream, how do you still see that showing up in organizing spaces and the work that you're doing today? Oh, I mean, you, you, you touch on a very important thing when you talk about it, it, it even comes with contributors to um, grassroots organizations, right? Um, I want to put this in the right context. I have a, in, in, in politics done right, I'm going to kind of shift a little bit if, if, you, if you allow me this. That's your program. Yeah, that's, th program. that's my program, Politics Done Right. And it is, it is well designed, it is connected using social media networks, and it's a complete turnkey thing, right? And the truth of the matter is I'd love to expand that because I, as I told the group yesterday, we should have hundred, the mainstream media is not for us progressives because we don't fit the neoliberal profile. So it is something I would love to replicate by the hundreds. It'll have a lot of folks doing the, these things. And then we get that intersectionality right. of different folks right. doing it. Love to do that. Right. But all of that takes funding, right? And I find it interesting that people that don't have that entire picture. And by the way, when I talk about having the picture, I'm not only talking about having the picture of what I'd like to do, but having the picture of what I am doing. So it's actually affected already. It, it, the procedures is there. The interactions are already there. I have a small group of people that believe in what we're doing and do some support but it it doesn't near cover everything if 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 and based on what i know you know pro people always talk about progressives being the the way progressives are we believe in inclusiveness and that sort of a thing sure. you would not imagine what percentage of my supporters are actually on the conservative domain as opposed to the progressive domain. And I see so many progressives out there. And I, I, I don't want to disparage this, but I want to say it in a form that says that, you know, they do here and there stuff and they get easily funded, right? But uh, somebody like my complete turnkey system fight like hell to first get respected and second, uh, trusted that they feel you deserve to have this. I, I hate to put it that way, but again, like I said, I keep the smile on. Uh, I don't lose the hope, but I do understand that much of the tribulations that I have, even in the activist world, isn't a conservative thing. It's a ethnicity thing. Mm -hmm. It's a POC thing that if somebody had this type of operation, Nobody would think twice in saying, wow, this is something we can build on mm -hmm. because you've shown that with one person, you can have all these permutations going. Imagine if we could duplicate that. If it were done in another embodiment, I am very sure that it would be very well funded. But again, tribulations of an Afro-Latino Caribbean man and the most important part, Racism didn't stop my smile, hope, or journey forward. I'll continue the activism. I'll continue pushing the message. I'll continue making sure that we lift people up. We have great people like Neil Aquino and yourself doing the work and, and understanding the concepts and trying to push the concepts. And that's what we got to keep doing, irrespective of all the things. But one of the things I hope to do with this book is to let people see, look, uh, when these things occur, first of all, for those who know, who are doing it knowingly, hey, we get it. We understand where you're coming from. And with the hope also of enlightening those who don't realize that these things happen. Yeah. Yeah, I will. Right. Right. I'm glad to say that. And you moved to a neighborhood um, of Houston called Kingwood. What's Kingwood? 
Why you that? is a nice woody community that when I moved here in uh, 97, I think, was right. pretty damn white. And it's part and of Houston. They... It's a, it's a, it, just to make sure, it's a, it's a part of Houston. It's one of those places where it, they don't necessarily want you to know that. Right. But, but it is. It is a part of Houston, and they raised hell when Houston annexed them because they right. they wanted profit from the oil business that is centered in Houston, but they didn't want to be associated with right. those people. They're a bit too different. They're a bit right. too, well, you know what. Right. So they raised hell as they were annexed. But remember, there ain't no Kingwood without Houston. Right. The, there aren't these high salaries of these folks who live in Kingwood, if there was no history. You see, those are the things that people don't think about that activists like yourself make people realize. But anyway, so I came to Kingwood, and yes, it was a very, at that time, I mean, it was much, it, it is still a very white community. It's not as much right now. I, I mean, it's not, it still is, but there are a lot of people of different ethnicities that are moving in, uh, that, that have moved in since then. But one of the reasons that I that I moved here is not only that it was beautiful with the trees. I love the trees. You know, it was it was kind of green in the wind in the summer, like it is in Panama. Not as green, but kind of green. And also, the school system was very good. So I wanted my daughter uh, here uh, for for that purpose. There was there was there was extensive flooding in Kingwood, wasn't there? For Harvey? yes, and and interestingly. In as much as Kingwood didn't want to be a part of Houston, Sylvester Turner, one of the first places he came was to Kingwood to make them whole. Do you think, uh, you may not know, but do you think other neighborhoods in the city got, got an equal treatment? No, absolutely not. There are just the audience, Sylvester Turner, black Democrat, mayor, mayor of Houston at the time. That is where people have to understand ethnic dynamics in cities. And it's complex. You know, it is like, um, you know, people always talk about integrating the police force, right? They always talk about getting more black officers on. Do you think I fear a white officer more than I fear a black officer? Do you think I fear a white officer more than I fear a Latino officer? I fear a Latino and black officer much worse than I fear a white officer. How come? How comes? Because it's the system. The system, uh, uh, the, the system tells you that uh, that the ex that black officer and that Latino officer feels more accepted if they can show that they have really given it to those who look like them because they are now a part of the family it's a it's a dynamic very few understand but i have seen if you if you if you have any doubt about that remember what happened i think in tennessee the the kid that got beat the crap out of in memphis in memphis yeah that's, that's all that's you have to see as an example or if you take a look at every time you see white cops beating up black uh bodies or poc bodies see how many of them actually say back off a little bit back off a little bit ne never never happens mm -hmm. so we have to understand the dynamics of power and that is what few understand chapter 19 of your book the intersectionality of police justice and people of color right so this right is, this is something you've consistently talked about and you have talked about encounters that you've had pulled over yes in fact i i spoke about that encounter when this white officer pulled me over and i'm very respectful to officers right. period i mean they have the gun and they have the, the 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 da generally on their side so i understand the power dynamics so i'm always respectful of hold the the, uh, the I, I make sure and let them see my hands and i spoke to this guy this guy was smirking because he saw how careful i was he had no fear of me whatsoever this was in a houston this was near the studio right this, this was near kpft in a Houston neighborhood inner inner loop inner, inner inner loop neighborhood and i really got stopped just for who i was and i understood that and uh, he gave me some ridiculous reason that he was stopping me but i knew it was really to check me out and that's fine so he stopped me to check me out and you know i was respectful to him and he was very very respectful to me and for me it was shocking so i drove off and then i drove back in maybe a stupid thing to do but i did and i said hey can i get a picture with you because i was so really taken aback that this officer was nice to me i took a picture with him I uh, went to the studio. I talked about it. I wrote a blog about it. The guy got a, commendation, a community commendation 
after the blog came out and went viral and uh you know the the sergeant called me up wanted you know all, all this kind of stuff because here it was i gave this white cop a good kudos for treating me like a human being when i talked about that at kpft liberals wanted to have my ass well, that was my next question yeah how'd that go over yeah go ahead ask it and then you, i asked it i asked it you were answering it. go keep going yeah they hated me for actually giving a commendation giving a good good works to the cop who then got a commendation he said they should have that's their behavior that they should have in the first place and my liberal friends my, well my i like calling progressive my progressive friends were right but like i put in a subsequent blog i said look just maybe if we start commending these guys for doing their job we will save a few bodies because they will see they will get to see how it feels to be treated well um, to be when they do well to get treated well and, and when they point. do badly to get treated badly and and you and and well ask this and alex seems like you, uh, you might have a question you make a point on the show to treat um on kpft the, the six o'clock broadcast politics done right kpft 90.1 fm houston texas um and to treat conservative callers well you have a continuous stream of conservative callers so yes. obviously they feel welcome I, I, I want everybody, conservative, liberal, I want everybody to feel welcome because my thing is, if we're talking to each other, we're not fighting. So my, my show doesn't care about ethnicity, ideology, race, none of that matters. Everybody, I always say, you're all my friends, right? No kidding. And I don't mean that, for me, that is not, uh, it, for me, that, for me, it's real. Maybe if anybody who knows me knows I have this Latino thing, I come and I'm giving you this big hug and a big back slap, no matter who you are, get in trouble during the Me Too for a little bit because everybody loved it till I found this one progressive girl that she was in a line of people hugging me and doing things. And when she came about, I went ahead and hug and she pushed me and said, I don't do that. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, shoot, my God, what did I do here? Me Too, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, so I stopped doing it. I stopped the the hugging way that nosotros somos de panama that kind of a thing and then my my friend started to say what the hell happened to you egberto you're not the same jolly guy anymore how do you make one person and that a damn progressive person one person change who you are then i decided okay i'll try to just kind of look a little bit more if the person is getting hesitant when we behave the way we behave so that's a but that's about it alex what do you got yeah i i think this topic between the interaction with officers and talking about the distinction between you know different officers whether white black latino and then also just this interaction just continues to highlight for folks the just absolute complexity of navigating the world as a person of color uh, but also all of the identity and ethnicity and cultural uh, impacts around what develops behavior and what develops our, our approach and develops our thinking. And, and we really limit ourselves when we try to get a group think approach implemented around any issue or around any interaction, because it's actually through our diverse interaction, our diverse ideas, our diverse backgrounds, and how we're, you know, uh, developed different behaviors or approaches or things like that help us discover what is the path forward, help us test out and think through different ideas. And I think uh, a lot of times uh, we restrict ourselves when we overly condemn uh, a singular act when, when someone is navigating this immense amount of complexity that you've been highlighting throughout this conversation, Alberto. I want us to be in a position where everybody is allowed to make mistakes. Uh, whatever kind of mistakes it is, ethnic, ethnic mistakes, racial mistakes, I have made them, okay? Uh, sexist mistakes, I have made them. I want people to know they can make these mistakes, but I also want to make sure that people have a place to land. In other words, engage, do these things, be around folks, screw up. 
And I want the people who are the, the, the ones that are aggrieved to be able to be thick skinned enough, strong enough to say, uh, I, I get it. I can actually work with you and say, hey, that what you've done is not right and that you learn from that. Now, if you keep doing the same kind of stuff that harms people or that shows some sort of a supremacist being, whether it's male supremacy, white supremacy, any kind of supremacy, then after a while, you know, we dump you. But we have to give, I don't know what I don't know. Most Americans are reared a certain way. You can't ask folks that's been reared under the cancer that was created since the inception of this country to know everything. So I think the first play, the first thing comes in understanding that, and I talk a lot about that in my book. The first thing is understanding where people come from. I, the other book that I will call "It's Worth It: How to Talk to Your Right Wing Relative Friends and Neighbors." It, it it's about first of all getting people to trust you. Secondly, after they trust you, giving them the the, the reality that you you accept that they'll make mistakes because you make mistakes yourself. And then the other thing is that they have a place the land, the, the, the white supremacist, the KKK person or whatever, many of them don't want to be there. They're there because that's their home. That's where, that's what they know. And if they felt like they had a place to land, that they would, that they could still have an existence outside of where they're comfortable, it'll open the doors, not for all, but some to come and join you. And in a democracy, that's all that we need. You took a turn to kind of a full-time activism. Yes. Why'd you do that? I was always a, a talker. In other words, I always was a radical from people will tell you from from being in high school. When I got to the University of Texas, I marched with the group that says, let's get the, United, the, the University of Texas divestiture out of uh, the South African apartheid right. regime. Those are the kinds of things right. that I did. When I joined corporate America, I had to be quiet. It was difficult. I used to blog. and They, were, they weren't called blog then. They were called CompuServe. That's before your time, Alex. And uh, you know, it was it was CompuServe and all those different uh, online bulletin boards and that kind of a stuff, right? Yeah. So I used to do that under a pseudonym. When I formed my own software company, I couldn't be this radical out there either because you know my customers were from NASA to Boeing to all these oil companies, etc. So I had to watch what I say. So I also uh, 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 blogged under two pseudonyms that you guys could find, Tolerant Liberal and Black Stallion, you know. Uh, so I did under these different, different uh, blogged under these different things. When my daughter uh, got out of high school that I know that my activism wouldn't hurt her in school or hurt her among her friends, it was like liberating. I started to do radio first in a, a little radio station in Canada. Then I started to do it, uh, you know, broke out here with the coffee party and some other or moved to amend and other organizations. I started working on, on, on doing radio and blogging and writing. And then uh, when my website started to make enough money, I said I, I really got tired of the software business. The software business made me a lot. It bought my house, my cars, my everything. I even got to put away a few bucks that I all spent now because of 12 years of activism that hadn't paid. What happened is the following. Uh, I decided to go full activism. I was making enough after I reduced all my costs to do this. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom fell out, meaning Google, Facebook, and all of them changed the algorithm that cut my income by, guess what? I'm talking about my, my inner, by 90%, one flip of the switch by these companies. 90% haven't recovered since. Uh, but the idea being, we all look whenever things are going wrong. We all say, damn it, this person needs to do something about that. Damn it, that person needs to do something about that. And you have to kind of ask yourself, if you're asking everybody to do something about it or somebody else to do something about it, what the hell are you doing? And the thing is, I had the wherewithal. I knew how to build a platform. I knew how to do all these things to make money elsewhere. Maybe I could do this to create a better, uh, a better America. Not me alone. I'm, I'm trying to be facetious, but being one of the small grains of sand right. that actually can do it, right? right? And right. and I did that. Now it has not been the best move 
financially at right. all because right. of that. Yeah, yeah I, I can, I resemble that remark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. But I tell you one thing about it you know, you are making a difference. Like you, Neil, making a difference. Like you, Senor Montalvo, making a difference. And I right. think this is so key what you're highlighting this, this transition and the cost of this transition and, and the impacts of, you know, navigating the model as is and then the model changing is that it's really important for folks to understand that the money in the industry is still there. Mm -hmm. There's millions of dollars going to candidates and campaigns. There's so millions of dollars going to large nonprofits. Yeah. Both of them collaborate and share labor with grassroots organizers. I mean, we could highlight the number of people, Egberto, that you've had on your show and go for another hour. Mm -hmm. You know, you had AOC. You had, even in the local primary, local candidates, you had Sean Tier and Kim Og, who were battling over the DA position. So they value the work you're doing. They utilize the space and the audience you've built. Um, and yet we don't see nearly enough of that share of resources going to politics done right from that part of the infrastructure, that part of the ecosystem. And then large nonprofits have also benefited from your work. Um, you know, and I know you highlighted amazing organizations like uh, the Poor People's Campaign, which which may not be an example of someone who, who has all the money in, in terms of this work because of what they're doing as well, but there are large nonprofits who have also benefited from, from your work. Um, and we really need people to understand that the decisions they're making, either in their contributions, in their donations, or in their support, um, makes a huge difference. And if 10% of the current market share went to grassroots organizers, We'd be set. Roberto, wrap us, wrap us up. Close us out. First of all, I, I want to uh, thank the Texas Grassroots Alliance for having me on today to not only discuss uh, my book, but also our uh, progressive movement. Thank you so kindly. Please visit us at politicsdoneright.com. Uh, you can get my book at politicsdoneright.com slash books. Yeah. Thank you so kindly, Neil. Thank you so kindly, Alex. Uh, th this has been a very enjoyable experience. Okay, appreciative of your time. Buy the book, it's a great gift too. Uh, excellent Mother's Day gift, Father's Day gift, buy bulk copy of McBurdo's book. Move it up the list. This has been Texas Grassroots Alliance live stream. Thank you for everyone for watching and your support and we will be back at you soon. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to, trying to parse it into a form Anyway, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. That was the interview that we did last week uh, for my book. Uh, Eric, I'm going to have to take you out for some coffee and slap you around a bit, brother. Love you, but look, what uh, you know? let me tell you what free money is, brother. Free money is what pastors get when they pass around the collection plate. Free money is what Elon Musk gets when he gets free money from our government to build things that don't necessarily work. Free money, that if you really want to know what free money is. Now, that those two guys that you see out there, they're on the road. They're trying to uh, help people move up, right? Uh, they're, they're, they're trying to help people move up. And, you know, they should be paid as well, you know, for doing the job. I'm sorry. That's how it works, right? That's how it works. I want to get, uh, you know, the, the, the difference is the following, my brother. When you when you go when you want to buy certain things, you are forced to pay, right? Right here, I'm doing a service as far as you know, make making people aware of things, activism by showing people how to get involved politically, etc. But we don't say we charge you for this. We say if you find if you want to help us do this kind of work to make our democracy better, invest in doing the work to make democracy get better. And you said everything costs money and Tesla losing 10% of your jobs. And that is because El Senor, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Elon Musk, instead of concentrating on his car business, he have his mind on a whole lot of other things. Notice I left my software company so that I could concentrate on doing one thing. You can't do a whole million things at the same time and think you can be good at any. Elon Musk is a lousy businessman.
I know he makes billions. Some people have the silver spoon in their mouth. Some people have all the privileges that many others don't. But it's not come across that way. SpaceX is not important. SpaceX is not important at all. Everything that SpaceX did, we did with a computer that's cheaper than this phone, that is less powerful than this phone. SpaceX is, I mean, I, I know it is interesting to go ahead and look at SpaceX like a great addition. Now, Starlight is an important concept, not designed by, by uh, Elon Musk. So let me just let you know the technology that goes into moving all this data around, not Elon Musk is doing. He doesn't know, he doesn't understand those concepts, but Starlight is important. You're absolutely right about that. Anyway, folks, please support the program. How can you support the program? Please become a patron. Politicsandright.com slash Patreon. Politicsandright.com slash Patreon, spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Patreon, spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Please consider becoming a patron of the program. You can also go to politicsandright.com slash support for all the different ways in which you can support the program. Most importantly, I would like to ask all of you to become a paid subscribers of our newsletter at politicsandright.com slash newsletter politicsandright.com slash newsletter. You'll be helping us promote the messages and talk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Lee Grant says Starlink is a satellite internet constellation operated by Starlink, a wholly uh, uh, owned of Sidera, the American aerospace company, SpaceX, providing coverage to over 70 countries. A very good system, an important system. You're right about that. We'll talk about that some other time. Please support us at politicsandright.com slash newsletter. And lastly, but not least, please consider getting the book we just spoke about, and it's called Tribulations of an Afro-Latino Caribbean Man. And uh, I guarantee you it's a read you will enjoy. And how can you get that book? Just visit our bookstore at politicsandright.com slash books. I got to get out of here. My name is Egberto Willis. Thank you so kindly for listening. My name is Egberto Willis. And... How do I end this program? We are what? Out! Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is a progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, progressive, conservative, or otherwise, you get to hear your point of view. We are an independent media outlet that, unlike mainstream media beholden to corporations, we only owe allegiance to you. Remember, you can also send me a tweet at E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S. That is at Egberto Willis. Let us engage. It is politics done right.